Uh, Emma Fryer, costume designer for Lady Chatterley's Lover, an adaptation of one of the most influential novels of the 20th century. Uh, had you read the book before joining the film? A very long time ago, I feel, Joyce. And then I have to admit, I didn't reread the book because I love, I mean, for me, the most brilliant starting point is that script and that the importance of the script. And it was a great script. Um, the first reading of, of it, I think, is as a costume designer, just sitting quietly, that first read is pivotal to just sort of creating pictures in your head and just sort of trying to visualise who these characters are. And sometimes you can go on a whole journey with a character. And I always think you very often come back to those very first thoughts that are actually connected with the first read of a script. Um, so the script is is just so important to me I think and it and it is the a real starting point to any sort of project and reading Lady Chatterley was just yeah it was just joyous actually I was really excited after I'd finished reading it. Mm -hmm. So what were your first thoughts after reading the script? My first well there's it's certainly in terms of it just being very I guess just something that seemed very current today that you that just feels that it could be part of in, ter in, in terms of Connie I think she just feels like she she could be very much a woman of today and Absolutely. certainly yeah there's there was a there's still a sense of a modernness about it which I very much then wanted to actually sort of translate into her costuming um and just, I think there was, a, there's a little bit in it that actually um, just, just definitely something about, there was, there's something about the contemporaneous of it, to her actual journey as a woman today, which is very sort of resonates with women still very much in 2022, which I wanted to actually access and be part of her costuming. Um, and just the sort of her free, she's, she was a very much, comes across as a free spirit, very modern and a real sort of bohemian feel, which are all sort of elements that I very much wanted to actually translate into the wardrobe that she had on the, on the film. Yeah, for sure. I loved all of her dresses. I was like, I, I want those dresses, but no, I, I, I totally agree. And because uh, it, it, the, the book is um, like a, a symbol of freedom of expression still and, and yeah. quality and like, and her owning her body and sexuality. Um, but yeah, I like the, her dresses had a breeziness to them. Like they didn't feel very structured or like overly costume like maybe you would imagine in like a period piece in 20s England like I, I feel like if you just mentioned that to someone they, they would just picture corsets or something or just kind of really like stuffy like big dresses yeah we've kind of we sort of lost because we're late we're sort of so it's world war one we've almost lost we sort of lost the pit we talked a little bit Emma and I but the course it was completely gone on her and there was a at the beginning I felt I wanted her to have a slight sense of more period and feel a bit more buttoned up but then certainly once we get to rugby and we've gone from winter through to sort of into the spring and then the whole relationship starts developing with Mellors I really wanted there to be a, a looseness to her and and have these sort of sensual contours and and I think what was oh, what was just so what I just feel still feel so much about this job is that and it should happen on every job is that the mood boards that were done at the very beginning really came to life and they really truly actually did translate into Connie's final wardrobe um and there was a real you know there was a there's a real sense of definitely there's a loss the rigidness of the earlier part of the Edward one is 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 very much gone um and there's a looseness to her costuming which I think Benoit the DOP sort of almost that's almost in the cinematography as well which is which is which is a lovely sort of connection um I think in my head there was a 
there was a the bohemianness in my head I had sort of Kate Moss at Glastonbury Festival <laughs> there was a, that sense of you know not not that Connie has got Wellington boots but the sense of kind of a real juxtaposition of Wellington boots and then sort of really lightweight sheer fabrics and embroidery on glaze and muslins and a little bit of layering and um, certainly that I I sort of wanted to actually breathe into the costume once we started having sort of the once the affair actually starts happening with Mellors. Um, so the 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 seasonal changes in the script had a had an importance to the journey of the costuming, and certainly had a you know we went from rich exotic sort of tweeds and velvets to then lightweight summer fabrics, lots of sheer layering. Um, and just even underneath those sort of, there was, I used some, we, we had a mix of making because some of, a lot, there was tailoring in Connie's costumes or making, we had a, a making department that actually made for Connie. Some of the costumes were sort of original, authentic costumes from the period. And then I actually did introduce some high street labels that I just felt really work so well for the Yeah, because there is a, a time of a, a type of a timeliness and uh, modernness to it because it, it like you said it feels like very bohemian and just it more, yeah. more casual than you might imagine like 20s England to be. Yeah so. there mm -hmm. was um, a sense of this sort of sense that I mean it's I think it is really great if you can think of a character now in your so we are so we were sort of you know 1919 almost 1920 and who if Connie was in the world now in 2022 who would she be would she be this bohemian kind of you know young woman who was at art college mixing sort of like interesting fabrics together and her lace-up leather boots and 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 I think I really wanted that feeling with her character if there's a sense of seeing even though we are in a period world, but still sort of visualizing who that person is in the world that we live in now. Um, mm. And certainly in the fitting with Emma, it was, we had such fun <laughs> because I think the clothes, because the clothes we felt, even though they were, you know, they still have the, but their clothes that certainly I would be, Emma would be happy to wear today. And yeah, I don't think yeah. even, and, 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 nobody would you know look at them as as strictly period clothes um but equally still still along the journey it's it's still about character as much you know you're still creating the right clothes for the character and bring and going on a journey together with an actor to to actually bring this character to life yeah um, um, well, you, you referenced this before, but I also love how the color palette with her wardrobe um, evolves, like Connie uh, uh, in the beginning, like she still feels trapped at this stage. So she's in darker tones and like you said, like tweeds, but then after she meets Oliver, it's brighter colors and he's, his silhouette is blue. And then mm -hmm. she's like, there's more blue incorporated in her, uh, her wardrobes. Uh, so how did you go about like kind of just melding their two silhouettes together and having her like I her costume awakening I guess when after she meets him um I mean I thought about Mellas a lot at the beginning and, and it's I very much looked in it and I mean we had obviously we've got a friend we had a French lovely French director and a lovely French DOP and then looking at because I always start still looking at the original period reference because I think you've got to you always you have to start with your period reference and then you can sort of twist it or turn it or slightly change it um so very much did with Mellis but I didn't want to go down that route of him being in the world of which is probably true the period sort of darker fabrics browns leathers um a very big thought was just the environment that we were filming in once they leave London and just you know we are we were actually filming in these amazing, in the amazing Welsh countryside and our backdrop is nature. Um, and so a lot of the backdrop 
is green and working with that as a color palette and then contrasting the costume against that. And so I think that's why in my head, Mellors very much ended up in a sort of blue, just wanted to change the workwear clothing and loved the idea of just going into a, a blue palette, but layering it with different sort of different sort of textures and different colors of blue. Um, and in terms of Connie, it just was, it was, it was still very script driven in regard to still the seasonal changes. Um, and then just because I did want her to start off a lot darker. And then as we go from the London world, then we go to rugby, we have that a little splash of the red dress that she wore at the May Day Festival. And then as the affair sort of develops, there was quite a lot. It was, the, there were, the, the fabrics were quite sheer and a lot of them were quite see-through. So, which worked really well in terms of sort of the journey and, and the script. But then I did layer that with really lots of sort of, lots of very fine petticoat. She had some really lovely little camisoles tops and, and just, just little details of lace and embroidery and embroidery on glaze. Yeah, I love fabric. the yellow one, her, her yellow shawl. Yeah. Yeah. And then I and then splashing, I, I just splashing a bit of color in a belt or something that she had around her waist. So even though there were all these really sort of fine white cotton costumes, like there was a little sort of peach underneath, and then a stronger color around her waist. Um, we did. I don't know. We did. I did do the a sort of version of a teens velvet hoodie top which she wears quite at the beginning in that rust color <laughs> um but Benoit was great because he came to the costume house quite early on and we we had quite a, you know he came with law and we were talking about where we were filming and again we were talking about you know the wild wells the nature the welsh countryside and the, the fact she's sort of trapped in the world at the beginning and then she goes to rugby and then the sort of freedom that she that her sort of she, her change with Mellors and how she becomes free um and that the freedom to go into the woods and the, and the meadows and so there was there was quite a lot of conversation of 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 color palette against nature actually and and sometimes it sits quietly and other times it was sort of jumping out a little bit more um, but that was sort of dependent on the sequence of, of a scene or what the journey that she was going on that actual story day and sort of plotting that through as we were as we were sort of going through the movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, well, they were all completely enviable costumes. I, I want all of it. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, Emma, thank you so much for your time. It was great speaking with you uh, and congratulations on the film again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Marcy Rogers, costume designer for Tell. Uh, this is such a devastating and important true story. Where do you begin when you join a project like this? Um, truthfully, I began the Oracle, which is the truth. Um, I'm a native of Chicago, so I took a step back and just really drove around the city and tried to encapsulate what it felt like to be living in Chicago in the, 19, in the mid 1950s. Um, but then also contemporarily, I reached out to the Chicago History Museum and just to see what information they may have had and even historians, uh, because they have a list of historians that may have gathered information that we didn't see as, as the general public. Um, and I also started to listen to some of the music. I mean, obviously there's the opening scene where Danielle is singing, but just trying to ground myself into the world of music and um, vibration. Mm -hmm. um, so what did you learn or pick up from all your research or, and like what, what kind of research was it? But besides just like uh, historical stuff, did you do like uh, look at old catalogs, like fashion catalogs from the era as well? I did. I mean, truthfully, I, one thing that I've, I've, I've said before is that I noticed that um, 
we don't see a lot of photos other than what's been publicized of Mamie and Emmett. And I was very adamant about creating a costume or a wardrobe world where they coexisted in Chicago in the 1950s. And they also coexisted in Mississippi and how Chicago bled into Mississippi. And truthfully, Mississippi bled into Chicago during that time because there was a migration. There was literally, you know, kind of like a circular uh, movement of Chicagoans into Mississippi and Mississippians into Chicago. So <clears throat> Chicagoans. So I did that, but then there are obviously historical research and books that I um, had reference to. I had already kind of been exposed to the era because I did a movie with Steven Soderbergh about a two or three years ago called No Son of Move. And that was Detroit. And so Detroit is not too far off from Chicago, as far as silhouette is concerned. Um, and also, I actually asked my father and I started to try to kind of dig into photos just personally um, to see what I can find to make sure that it felt like Chicago in 1955. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe Chicago fashion in 55? I think it was not compared, it is not to be compared, and I said it as a proud Chicagoan, um, it is not to be compared to any other city. Mm -hmm. um, I think Chicago still had the essence of Southernism, if you will, but those who were able to migrate North um, and, and, and make a bit of a living for themselves or have some type of um, independence. They were, they used, I think I feel, I mean, based off of my artistry, they used that to, and they exemplified it through wardrobe. Um, and, you know, at that time we had Marshall Fields. So if you were able to, afford to go into Marshall Fields, that was pretty fashion forward. Um, because truth be told, during that time, Chicago was, although it was considered um, by way of some sort of independence from the South, it was still segregated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do love that the movie opens with Mamie and Emmett going shopping in a department store, because I really do feel like your designs and, and the wardrobe uh, really capture the cultural differences and the racial dynamics between Chicago and Mississippi. And like you said, um, you, you know, they, they had more freedom in the North in Chicago and could move about relatively unbothered. They, they still face kind of some prejudice, but they were middle class. They had jobs, homes, a full wardrobe. They wore different clothes every day. And in the South, you know, they were wearing the same like white shirts every day, picking mm -hmm. cotton. And so how did you approach designing the different uh, silhouettes and palettes for Chicago versus Mississippi? I mean, I was very adamant about having Mamie's costume opening scene to be something that was light. Um, and what I mean by that is, I mean, I, I mean that figuratively and, 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 and kind of poetically, meaning the, the, the color value of pink that I chose was very fluffy, if you will. Um, for a lack of better words. And um, even with Emmett being yellow, uh, Shinyoya and I spoke about Emmett's color being yellow. So if you see, um, kind of fast forward a bit, you have Emmett in yellow opening act, and then you have Mamie taking Emmett to the train. That to me was a symbolism of Chicago or Emmett leaving going to Mississippi and he bled into the Mississippi, so to speak, poetically. And then when he comes back in the opening scene or the last scene, my apologies, of the movie, you see that he's glow, he's like basically encapsulated in yellow. Um, that was important to me. And I, I wanted Mamie not to feel so anchored in color because after all, she's taking her son down to an iconic store which, I mean, I grew up visiting when I was a kid and and juxtaposing her even in that world of Marshall Fields by way of the other consumers. 
and how she still presented herself as a classy woman, knowing that it was a possibility that she could be um, judged in some way. For sure. Um, yeah, I do love the the use of yellow uh, in their wardrobe. Um, and like you said, in the train station scene, like that's when she's wearing her striking, gorgeous yellow dress. And I also love the detail in his tie. There's like splashes of yellow in there. Oh, too. I did that on purpose. So so Emmett's clothes, for the most part, 90 percent of his wardrobe I built. And I was very, very, very meticulous about his wardrobe because I felt like what we've seen publicly, there's only like three or four photos, but how was I going to like kind of have like nuggets and and like trinkets of him throughout the wardrobe without it being overbearing and just kind of like jarring and hitting you over your head. So his, 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 his tie kind of was a beautiful mistake. When I saw it, I was like, this will go well with a suit. But then I saw the little specks of yellow and it, or gold and it made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, and I also love when when he is in Mississippi, like you said, he was he's uh, Chicago was like bleeding into Mississippi, and like his clothes still stood out there. Like it wasn't the same, even if he was wearing he wasn't wearing a suit, but he's still wearing like his nice hat. Okay. For sure. So so the so the scene where he's picking picking cotton, I remember I was in LA and I was pulling fabric for that, and I found that particular fabric, and truthfully, that fabric is very uncomfortable. It's it almost feels like sandpaper. And I chose that fabric on purpose because I wanted Jalen to feel how uncomfortable it was in 2022 to be in a cotton field in that on his body, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. or on his person. And so, and then you go to the juke joint, which is another look that I built. I wanted him to have some color and some like pizzazz and texture. Um, but he never really left the house, as he said in the movie, you know, he he was dressed, so he didn't leave the house without his socks and shoes on, let alone his hat. Mm -hmm. um, well, you also had to recreate some uh, replicas like uh, Mamie's uh, jet cover dress with the, the giraffe dress that everyone knows. Um, so how did you go about doing that? <laughs> that was a bit of zooming in and zooming out and zooming in and zooming out. I'll be honest with you. I would like to give thanks when thanks is due to Rebecca Hall, because as you know, I design passing. So I had already kind of had my eye in tune with black and white photos. So it kind of helped me with understanding the color value and interpret or like not in well, interpreting that photo, that jet magazine photo, but then translating it into color. Right. Because I went from design and color to passing black and white to now back in color. So, it, again, it was definitely zooming in and out, kind of like getting different angles. And 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 from afar. You're not necessarily paying attention to the fact that it's giraffes. Right. You just see it as a pattern or some type of abstract pattern. But when you zoom in, I was I, I had made a a marital uh contract to myself that that if anything had to be correct because we that's what we know mm -hmm. yeah for sure um uh well after emma dies uh mamie's word of the color palette turns darker but she's not constantly wearing black like it's darker hues and there's one kind of metallic like dress um it looks like a little copperish and then um and i also noticed a lot of her dresses also had lines on it and i was wondering uh, what went into that design so Chinoya and I talked about this, that after, and as you know, like you're at the funeral, right? And she's in black, which is a dress that I had to replicate to a T. That dress was, you know, the fabric to the beading, even to the hat, let's just say, because the hat was a, was, was a thing. And Mamie wore hats historically based off the photos we've seen. Mm -hmm. So I just carried that on. But after Emmett, unfortunately passed I made um, well there's two looks that are historic there's the first day of court which is the sunburst pleated skirt which I think you're speaking of which is metallic and it's funny because it's actually not metallic it's gray it's gray uh -huh. taffeta but the underlying you know I've had people say to me is that purple is that like a light purple is it gray and I kind of wanted the fabric to kind of 
have its own emotion aside from whatever she was going through in that moment. Cause she's, again, this is Chicago walking through Mississippi. Right. And what I mean by that is the courthouse. Um, and then there's another suit that is historic that she wore a, maybe a few scenes after, which was gray. But I, I was trying to figure out what exactly does mourning look like to a woman who has now been assigned publicly to expose herself to the world by way of her pain as a Black woman? Mm-hmm. And why does it have to be Black? Um, I feel like gray is a bit of a rebirth. It's the start of something new because when we end the movie, we do see her on her bed silhouetted. And then you see Emmett, the, what would have been Emmett had he made it home. So that was done on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's um, beautiful, uh, gorgeous creations. And Marcy, it was great speaking to you. Uh, Thanks so much for your time. And we'll slip back to you in a little bit. Sure. Thank you so much. A costume designer for Women Talking. Were you familiar with the book by Miriam Taves? I was not familiar with that work of Miriam's, but I was definitely familiar with her work. She's one of my favorite authors. And uh, sort of all my worlds collided when I got the call for this movie because I've always loved Miriam's work. We grew up very close to each other, and a lot of the things in her work resonate with me because we're very similar ages as well. So, no, I was not familiar with the book, and then I was shocked by it, and then I was immersed in it. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming you read the book after. I did, you, yeah. yes. Within, uh, yes. I think <laughs> the, the hour after I got the call, Sarah's call. <laughs> yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. And so uh, after reading it, what, what kind of inspiration did you take from it? Well, it was horrifying for one thing. The the story was horrifying to me. Um, And I think because, uh, as I said, I grew up close to where Miriam Taves grew up in Southern Manitoba. And uh, seeing Mennonite women in plain dress is a completely everyday occurrence there. I, I grew up with Mennonite people in every aspect of my life. And Winnipeg is, people are, everybody's from everywhere. My teachers, my babysitters, my friends, my teammates are, are Mennonite people were when I was younger. And I thought I was quite familiar with, fami- with Mennonite culture. Um, not so much specifically religiously, but definitely with, with culture. And then to hear, read a story like that and delve further into the more fundamental ends, uh, more fundamental versions of of Mennonite culture was fascinating for me. And I fell hard down a a research rabbit hole for months and months and months, finding out how little I really knew, actually. And um, the, 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 the biggest part, I think, that informed my work on on this picture was the confinement of of these very simple seemingly simple clothes and the reasons behind them and you know you just a lot of people think oh they're it's a little house on the prairie it's very simple it's maybe that those are period dresses i've heard a few people refer to the to the film as a period film it's, it was and, on, it takes place in 2010 recent yeah times. So a lot of people are unfamiliar with the fact that people still live like that. Very many people still live like that. Well, I do think like that it's something about, like, I think the overall aesthetic and also your designs where it, the movie takes place in 2010, but the look uh, evokes something older because of the situation there. Yeah, I think it, it does. But uh, as I said, that we, we were very, very true to form. Uh, and those are, authentic. It, it's hard for us as modern secular women in particular to think of why would a farm woman want to spend a day in a polyester dress with, you know, with long sleeves and no pockets. That was, that was a huge revelation. I, I love pocket allowed, dresses. I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not allowed pockets because, and I found out as I delved a little deeper, it was so that there were no place for idle hands essentially imagine imagine having 10 children 
uh, being a farm wife, no electricity, no modern conveniences, no, and you don't even have a place to put your keys. And in, in fact, as we delve deeper into the research, you probably wouldn't actually have been given the keys. So it was really, really subtle things like that, that, that informed most of the work that we did. And as I said, things that I thought I knew about a, a culture that was familiar to me, so many more layers were added mm-hmm. to, yeah. to that. Uh, well, yeah. So you mentioned the dresses are polyester. So what was yeah. it like? Are they ever accruing the polyester and making uh, so many dresses? <laughs> that was quite an adventure. The whole movie was an adventure in in every respect. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. And the something using the example of finding the fabrics, those are real Mennonite fabrics bought from real Mennonite storekeepers, uh, shopkeepers, and Mennonite women. On farms, I had two amazing cultural consultants, Esther Jansen and Marianne Hildebrand, who uh, in southern Manitoba, first of all, allowed me to access people who who knew how to build the sort of things that we were replicating and knew how to source fabrics. I had, and both of them were absolutely I, I couldn't have done it without them. They introduced me to so many wonderful people and I made lifelong friends from from the search or during the search for all of this authenticity. And it was, uh, it made everything easier. Mm-hmm. They, they were so kind and so generous to help me and to tell me and to, to share with me what their lives were like, uh, what the, their processes were like, it was it was fantastic, but yeah, a lot of polyester. I think that's probably a better question for the actors. If you ever get a chance <laughs> like to ask wearing the actors, all the polyester, <laughs> you will get a range of uh, of reactions about the polyester. In fact, when I really first started shop, and and our amazing producer Lynn Nuchabello allowed me to start my research while I was still in Winnipeg, which is kind of the heartland in Canada for uh, Mennonite culture, uh, but, um, and then they moved farther south into Central and South America from there. That's a whole other story that I won't get into now because I, again, that's another rabbit hole. But Lynn allowed me to, to do, to start early essentially, and to source and research and do all of that work in Manitoba where I had the people at my doorstep essentially, you can't sw- swing a cat in my neighborhood in Winnipeg and not hit a, a Friesen or a Lowen or a Penner. So I had all of this help. Um, so I sourced in Southern Manitoba and then I came to Toronto where the film was made and had my other, uh, Esther, my contact here, helped me source, it, source in Southern, Southwestern Ontario. So all of, all of the stuff we bought is the real deal. In fact, in Winnipeg, there are, specific stores uh, in the city, but of course in the rural places too, that sell nothing but floral print polyester and plaid shirt, plaid uh, polyester blends for shirts and black denim denim for overalls, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 square feet of it. Nothing but. Incredible. Um, it was pretty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because the, the other thing is, is like these uh, dresses are, you know, it's basically like their uniform and they're very similar in shape and size. So how do you go about expressing the characters' personalities through their clothing when you are handicapped by, uh, you know, one outfit essentially and also their circumstances? And like they, the dresses are different with different patterns. Um, I think uh, Salome's is purple with like flowers and Marikis is green. So how did you land on the colors and the patterns for each of them? Well, that that was a really great process that I got to go through with Sarah, of course, but also with the actors. Each of each of us had our conversations about character and then and then uh, added in details. But I started by dividing the families for my own edification. I, I decided dif- divided the Friesens and the Lowens. Um, and I'm trying to remember which were the Friesens <laughs> were, it's hard to tell the players without a program, that's for sure in this, in this movie, because there's so many faces, but I divided them into temperament, essentially the Friesens I had 
uh, in my mind, and eventually it, it followed through to in more logical, precise, uh, regimented, maybe regimented, but in a, not in a harsh way, a logical sort of uh, patterns, group of patterns, group of colors, brighter, purer colors. And then the low ones, I had more in the natural patterns and and shapes and colors and, and mer they were murkier murk murkier is the word I'm after um Marike's uh dress for example I don't know if you'll notice and it's all quite subliminal the actors and I we knew what we were doing and and hopefully and I've had some feedback saying that people instinctively kind of figured it out what was going on the the low and ladies were a little bit more flowy and murky and troubled and indistinct. And then the Scarface, Scarface's family, the Jans family, I, because they were, their beliefs and or were so regimented, I went into the darker colors because it's more traditional, particular, I mean, in actual fact, the blacks and the dark reds for um, matrons, but also I wanted a sense of, of, immovability it rust and dried blood and just inability thing. yeah inability to to break free from what they knew so as i said i i presented those it was really three and the men are are even more limited but um so i didn't work as much with the color palettes for the men, because they had their, like you said, uniform of the plaid shirt and the, the overalls. But within the three groups that I created, I worked individually with Sarah, with the actors and also with Sarah so that she knew where I was going. And so that we could very, very subtly uh, differentiate between the characters and between the temperaments mm -hmm. as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, well, lastly, uh, speaking of Sarah, she mentioned that they walked into a Starbucks one day and the barista loved their dresses. <laughs> so what is your <laughs> reaction to that? I think I remember that, hearing about that. There was a Starbucks across from the studio. And I think on a mask break, we, they went across the street. Yeah, Funnily yeah, enough, I, <laughs> I sent a couple of pictures from very current Vogue issues to Sarah saying okay did we start this or did they start what's going on here because it really was uh in a lot of the high-end fashion magazines at the time mm -hmm. or just just previous to when we started the the prairie look I guess people yeah. would have called it or folk or you know it wasn't quite bohemian but there were lots of fashion magazines pictures so yeah I, I do remember hearing that that people thought, oh those are kind of great <laughs> you're such a trendsetter yeah oh well thank you <laughs> Uh, well, Keith, it, was, now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll see you back in a little bit. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our Meet the Experts costume design panel. Today, we are joined by Emma Fryer from Lady Chatterley's Lover, Marcy Rogers from Till, and Keita Alfred from Women Talking. Thank you all for being here. Uh, first, you. I would love to know, when did each of you... Uh, have first have an interest in fashion and clothes uh let's start with emma very very early on i always had an interest in clothes i was um goodness when i had very when i had jobs when i was very young going back to an age of about 14 i used to always i was a, a very sort of considered shopper because i'd always save my money to buy one just one item of clothing that was very special rather than buying lots of items of clothing that were less sort of money really. Um, I think when I was still in my sick form at school, I, I've definitely, I've got a funny caricature um, drawing that somebody's dad did of me for my birthday. And I certainly had, a, I think I just had a style that was very much my own style, um, not necessarily following any particular sort of fashion, but just putting clothes together in a way that was my own way, um, which was maybe a little bit quirkier or different to other people. Um, 
that goes back quite a long so yeah that's in the that's in the 80s and I guess I'm an 80s I'm very much an 80s um child and the 80s was such a an amazing time for clothing and fashion um and I did have a partner at the time who made his own clothes wore lots of makeup and probably influenced me quite a lot actually um in regards to fashion on the high street now changing so much that you can buy clothes very much a lot cheaper and in the 80s people still very much sort of made their own clothes and put their own sort of stamp on how they looked in a very different way and I think that probably did have a very big influence on me as a sort of young person growing up in the UK. Mm -hmm. I I feel like a lot of kids do that too like just kind of experimenting when um just dressing up like if if, like their parents don't pick up too so um I think I think it's yeah oh sorry (laughs) go ahead I think I think I think we I think people I think people made clothes more even mm-hmm. if they didn't make clothes well, they just did, they really did put clothes together very differently. And I think now we have all these amazing sort of vintage shops and high street shops. And I, I think people are still incredibly creative with putting clothes together, but perhaps we didn't have the choice that we, there wasn't the choice that we have now on the high street. Um, yeah, so sure. people were slightly more creative in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Um, Marcy, how about you? Did you make your own clothing back when you were a kid too? No, I actually was influenced by, I'm, I'm an 80s baby. So I was influenced by the music at that time. And the fashion that was coming out of New York. Um, and at that time, I was more so, you know, looking at the fashion or the fashion magazine 17, which I'm clearly telling my age and Vogue, Teen Vogue. But truly, like the hip hop magazines and and giving honor right now to Misa Hilton, who was integral in um, creating the brand of Little Kim, Notorious B.I.G., Puff Daddy. Um, I've said it before, I grew up in Chicago, so I had a lot of inspiration from my father. My father, I can say since I've been alive, I've, I've never seen my father in a pair of jeans, ever. My dad does not own a pair of jeans and he he uh, custom makes all of his clothes down. You know, it's truly from his hat down to his shoes. So I I had that creative sense. I kind of had my own identity, if you will. Um, When I was in high school, I was voted best dressed. I had no idea that I wanted to be a costume designer, but I wanted to be in fashion, whatever that meant at the time. so yeah, it was really what what the hip hop culture was influencing. And then I got exposed, obviously, to thrift stores, as Emma has said. And I remember coming home <laughs> as a young adult with bags of clothes because the thrift stores were like 10 cents in Chicago at the time and fabric. And my mom would be like, please stop bringing these clothes here. And I had no recollection of the era, so to speak. Um, and it's funny now, because when I go visit my parents' house, my mom has a bit of a walk-in closet of some of the things that I've required and kind of inspired her to get. And I think to myself, I, you you want to be the stop, but now you kind of took the baton. So it, it was a, a mosh posh of things. But I would say, truly, if I was to send you photos of my teenage years, it's definitely, you know, Aaliyah, um, TLC, um, and 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 the hip hop culture mm-hmm, for sure the best dress wow I, I was voted nothing in high school so <laughs> um Akita how about you I will unabashedly say that Barbie was my muse from the time I was I respect that. Yeah. four years old my <laughs> my mom taught me to hand sew when I was about four or five um I think so she could sleep on Saturday afternoons and I would do something and uh, I remember having a little, I think, a biscuit tin full of scraps and beads. I had a lot of beads and sequins left over from dance recital costumes and things like that. And I would put things together for Barbie and all her friends. And they were very well dressed. And it just kind of went from there. My, my, on my mom's side, um, her mom kept a lot of, thing, a lot of family garments from ages ago and I was always fascinated by uh, 
by p what we would call period garment, vintage, right? And uh, on the other hand, I used to wear, my dad had a lot of his own stuff still from when he was a young man and from the 50s. And, you know, when he was a stylish young thing. And I just remember putting on, for example, a, a crisp white, uh, imagine 100% cotton. I know both of you other costume designers can can appreciate that the difference in, a, in an old piece of fabric. And I was fascinated by that, by the difference between uh, garments from back in the day and, and modern ones. It just went from there. I, I was always the, the weird, I wasn't the best dressed, Marcy, at school. I was the weirdest. That's <laughs> what they called it at my school. I remember wearing that same white shirt with a big baggy pair of pants and and pumps. This would have been in the late 70s, I guess. I was in junior high, mid 70s. And people thinking I was out of my mind and I th thought I was fabulous. But uh, none of the rest of them are on this panel today. So I guess that worked. <laughs> But Again, I you're, you're always, a trendsetter, so yeah, it's like yeah. the, these these things always come back into fashion anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I was just fascinated by clothing I, from a very early age. Yeah, um, I was curious about how you guys go about addressing background artists, um, and just uh, I, I feel like when audiences watch films, like you know, obviously the the main characters are foregrounded, but if it's like a big scene, you still obviously need to dress her in the background appropriately for the scene. And I was thinking about like you know Till with like the, the the wake, um, and dressing all those uh, background actors, and also in woman talking, um, just a, a lot of more a ton of polyester dresses, not just the the eight women in the barn. Um, so yeah, so I how, how do you guys go about that and just uh, applying the same attention to detail for extras. Um, Marcy, let's start with you. I mean, for the wake, one of the, the, the things that Shinyoni and I talked about was that it needed to feel real. And I, I mentioned this before, I tried to get as many photos as possible from each angle. You know, it, I didn't want it to be too, too, I don't want to say this. I didn't want it to be to the point where every man had on a fedora. Right. Like, where was this person coming from? Were they coming from work? How did they even hear about the wake? Um, and broadly, you my process was to assign a bit of a backstory. Um, and the wake is the wake, I think, is a broader scene. But what I really appreciated was how money Mississippi looked and how the background looked in money Mississippi. And how they didn't look, they didn't feel dated. They kind of felt like, as I've said earlier, you know, like there was a migration, if you will, of, of fashion. And, and truly just exemplifying Black excellence. And that was important to me. Um, when I did the pulling of the costumes, obviously I had a team and I would like to thank each of them for their hard work. But I did go through each of the racks that were pulled at Western Costumes and other rack, you know, other um, custom houses and pull out what I felt just based off of the information that I immersed myself in for months and days and hours that may not have fit the overall world because you start with the overall world and then you, you extract uh, or at least I extract based off a of character and background. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Kita, how about you? I love dressing background. I love it. Whether it's for my own show or I've worked on many shows where I've been uh, not a background coordinator, but definitely a fitter for thousands and thousands and thousands. And I love it. I, I like to do three or four at a time. Get the, You know, there, are, there have been many, many shows where we've done 70, 80 fittings a day with teams, you know, and I love to just get everybody started and watch them play against each other and see how, you know, what, even what the vibe is in the room and given the instruct, whether it's my own show or whether I'm being instructed by another designer, I really love it because their background is so important to the feel of a film and because it can be uh, seamless and you don't notice it but you're enjoying the film and it paints a picture and it's beautiful or it can be really jarring which is when we haven't done our job correctly but 
I, I find there the enthusiasm of the people that that do that kind of work is infectious. And I it's almost like painting. I keep doing making this gesture, but I, I love it. I love getting all of them together and having a, a room full of clothes. It's almost like, you know, getting a bunch of your girlfriends are getting ready for a dance or something. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a high school dance. It's like, everyone, yeah, every, everybody yeah. contributes. I, I really love it. And it, it's such an important element and you can say a lot too. You can, you can differentiate, you can have your lead characters stand out or you can tell a different story by blending them. You can tell a story about you know, anachronisms, you know, things that, that work in a good way and things that don't, that things that are jarring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I love doing big, big crowds. Yeah. Uh, Emma, how about you? I think I, I very much agree with what's been said already. And, and, and what you said, Joyce, about attention to detail, because you never, you know, you're, you're painting a whole picture of, you know, you are painting pictures with your main cast and your background. Definitely. Um, the process, for me, is, is still the same. It, I, like, I would still use the same process and still do the same research that I would do for my main cast and then put boards together. Um, and then on Lady Chatterley, we had very clear, I guess, in, in terms of that, we had very clear, distinct worlds that we were creating. We had, we had London, the world of London and the wedding, and then we went to the countryside, which was a very different look. And then from the countryside, we went to Venice. Um, and the color palette changed within those different worlds and the fabrics changed within those different worlds and the seasons changed. So that was very much reflected in the costuming of our background. Um, but to just be, uh, we at the very beginning, um, once I was sort of clear with where I was going with palette and the different worlds, then we actually put, we put each world on a stand on stands before then they were the crowd were actually costumed and then that was that was something then I was able to that was sent out to our DOP I was very much able to chat to Law the director about it um, so that's so that's how it worked on that that job very specifically but again I think every job yeah the background are that they are really important and and attention to detail with background as as is in, as it is as important as your main cast because you never you never know know where the camera is going to go and it and it could you know it could it, you may end up having somebody in the background who's really very well featured so it's so important that you're really happy with everyone from top to bottom um, and that you're really sort of that you've really sort of clearly thought that through and you've got a very you know you've got a very clear head and it's and it's communication in regards to the team around you and because I like to be part of fittings but then I might not be able to be there the whole time so then as Keita said you might have a, another team who are actually sort of doing your crowd fittings so then it's being part of it at the beginning setting up the tone and the feel of those costumes and then letting people have fun because <laughs> as Peter said actually costuming background is it's really re it can be really creative and and it's really enjoyable so if as a designer you've given people a lovely wonderful visual then I think it's it's it is a lot of fun costuming background and we had we had loads of little children in Lady Chatterley and it was just great watching them coming in. <laughs> Putting them in period costume is actually really interesting yeah, because it's, it's just well a world they're yeah. so unfamiliar with. And and you know, what you just it was just it was just lovely. It's lovely actually. And I and and when you see people in period costume and they've never worn it before and they come out, they just they're happy. People are really happy when they've got a great costume. Yeah, because so, it's, it's like dress up. Because yeah, uh, like you said, you we don't wear this yeah. every day, modern yeah. life. So yeah. Um, so. Well, uh, lastly, uh, before Kita and I, we were talking. Uh, those doors behind you, you they're they're from a set. They're from Total Recall, which you worked on. So I was wondering, have you guys ever saved any costumes from any of the films you've worked on? Uh, Kita, let's go to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I, Probably pieces. I'm trying to think of specific 
things. Usually there's something sentimental about it. It's not so much about the artistry sometimes or the works, although I will try and save pieces like that, but it's something that reminds me of how the actor felt while they were in it, that I, something that I will keep. Like for example, on, on Women Talking, Sheila McCarthy had, we called it the ducks. She had a little hanky tucked in her sleeve all the time. That was really Greta. It just was a little, again, a little subconscious touch. She knew it was there. And she, I think she used it once or twice on, on camera. But little things like that, I will keep. Sometimes it's a a bit too much of a busman's holiday for me, so I'll go for a set piece rather than (laughs) I want to see any costumes after a while. Right. I want to be remembered, but little things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marcy, how about you? Um, I have a my uh, a married. I I I, my first actually my first production was she's got to have it, um, with Spike. So I have a. uh, uh, infamous coat that Nola Dar- Darling wore um, that will always remind me of my starting point but truly what I you know like Kita said I you get to a point where you just <laughs> after You're a while you just want to <laughs> not think about it I, in a good way though you know yeah. it's like you came you saw you conquered but I <clears throat> I do have and I do try to keep fabric swatches just so that I can always keep myself up to date with fabric that was in certain eras. Um, I do have, uh, you know, some things, my filmography, I, I like to say I've been a part of productions that are heroes without capes, you know, Black Klansmen. Mm-hmm. Um, and having to have certain fabrics there for different characters. Um, but Kita also mentioned a point just now about uh, a costume that I have access to for Don Cheeto when I did No Sort of Move with Soderbergh. And that was that's pretty precious to me because he wanted to reshoot the opening scene after we had been filming for six weeks because he didn't feel like he was his character until that moment. Um, and then more so now for Till, I still have some of the hand beaded prototypes of her dress. And, you know, they bring back memories. You always go back into that moment of, of emotion or mm-hmm. what you're trying to evoke. So it, it's a few. But then I also have like some costumes of commercials that I've done. Like I have a costume for Serena Williams when I did the Michelob commercial for uh, uh the it was her and Peyton Manning and that's kind of cool you know mm-hmm. just to have that and just be like oh Serena had this on so yeah yeah just a little stuff here or there um yeah. uh, Emma how about you I don't I'm just I was just thinking I don't I feel because at the end of a job you often have to pack it up and then and then it sort of goes in a box and then it belongs to the production company um who made the film um I have a little, I do have some amazing little prototype crowns that were made out of papier mache that were made on the grate actually that never got used. And they were just, they were just so beautiful. I, you know, I really did want to keep them. Um, but I don't have any costumes as such. On Lady Chatterley, Sir Matthew, who was cast as a Clifford, he, I think he would like to, his, all his suiting was tailored for him. And I think he very much would wanted to keep that. Um, it's always the so actors who want to keep it's more, yeah. I think, yeah, it's an interesting thing, Joyce, whether cast, because sometimes I think cast get to the end of a job and, and they've lived through that character and then that they, you know, they, they, they actually don't want to necessarily keep it. It's different on, certainly on a contemporary show. Um, on a period show, I think so, the, the, the suiting was tailored for Matthew so it wouldn't fit anyone else and they was you know they, they were beautiful so in terms of him keeping them them it seemed completely the right thing to do really yeah um but no I don't have a wardrobe full of costumes <laughs> in my, in my oh, yeah you all just you, when you're done you, would, you need a break from the clothes when you're done with the, it would be great for dressing up going out if I did <laughs> but yeah. I technically the studio like she said they 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 it's their likeness thereof. So we 
can't necessarily take the costumes. If there's extra fabric, I would try to make another costume, you know, just for like reminiscing sake, but it it belongs to the studio. It belongs to them, it's not yours. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. And so when we see our beautiful hard on creations uh in certain areas, it's like, you know, we have those moments, but with yeah. all due respect, it does go to the studio. Yeah. Um, well, it was great speaking with all of you. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations on all of your projects. There's uh, gorgeous creations and wonderful films. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. guys. <laughs>